Hi everybody, it's Adam over here, the geneticist and NGS data scientist from Verdua Healthcare. And I would love to welcome you to my talk on chromosome 8 and early aging. So, as you can guess, the chromosome 8 is actually the 8th largest chromosome in the human body. And what it does is, it makes up 4.5% you know, about 4.5% of our total genes. And what is the difference between the genes and the chromosome again? I'm sure you're able to answer the question by now. But anyway, let me give you a slight refresher. Okay, actually genes are packed within the chromosome. So imagine if you have like a lot of strings on the ground, it just looks so untidy and unneat. So what you do is you pack those into neat and tiny balls of string, just like that. And in our human body, we need this kind of tidiness as well. So we pack the genes into neat and very organized shapes, and they are called the chromosomes. So there are only four genetic ingredients in our human body. They will be G, C, A, and T. All right, and so every function in our body is derived from GCATs. Okay, and guess what? Chromosome 8 has got over 146 million DNAs. And I've drawn up here a map of chromosome 8 for you. You probably cannot see the details, but if you go to Google and search chromosome 8, you will see a map of this. I mean, if you're interested, this is not a requirement. But in later, in later talks, I will be pointing out some of the locations so that you know, okay, this disease is quite related to maybe this area of the gene or this area of the gene. Okay, right. So moving on, in this talk, we'll be, we'll be exploring one, two, three, four, five, and six genetic diseases associated with chromosome 8. Okay, so just one more refresher before we move on to the diseases. Actually, genetic diseases can be categorized into two types single gene disorder, meaning to say that, okay, there are some problems with either G, C, A, or T, there might be some substitutions, there might be some duplications or deletions, meaning missing parts, or even translocations that has caused these genetic diseases. Or an entire chromosome has been missing or has been duplicated, something like that. Okay. So, the first disease I want to talk to you about is the Burkitt's lymphoma. Okay, when you hear the word lymphoma, it is actually a kind of tumor within the lymphatic system. Okay, within the lymphatic system. And this is generated in the B lymphocyte in our immune system. So the B lymphocyte is actually one of the major components in our immune system. And this is a very fast growing human tumor because it is associated with impaired immunity. And so if this is left untreated, it can be very fatal because in order to control tumor growth, our immune system can cause cell death, okay? So if the immune system itself has been impaired, then there's really nobody who can manage, you know, the extra growths. Okay, so now what happened is that all kinds of Burkitt lymphoma is due to the deregulation, all right, meaning uh, hay going haywire or out of order within the C-MYC gene. Okay, so this is a bit of advanced knowledge. You don't have to remember it. And this CMYC gene is actually found in the 8Q24 location in the chromosome 8. So if you can remember from my last talk, 8Q is actually stand for the chromosome pair within the lineup. And then 24 is the location within chromosome 8. All right. So, moving on from there, 
The second disease I want to talk to you about is the Charcot Marie Tooth Disease. And in particular, this will be type 2 and type 4. Now, in simple words, this is a neurological disease. Okay, so it's a disease that has affected the nervous system. And so this is progressive, meaning to say once that there is a symptom coming out from your body, you will only get progressively worse, okay, in terms of the symptoms. And it affects, you know, all parts of the body, including muscle pain, uh, hand tremors, meaning to say your hand will shake uncontrollably, cold hand and feet, drop foot, sometimes uh, nerve pain. And how do you characterize nerve pain? Sometimes you feel like a, a burning or stabbing, stinging sensation, uh, very um, chronic fatigue. Sometimes you might be, you know, getting tired very easily. Numbness, curled fingers, just like that for no reason and you cannot control it. And even sometimes muscle atrophy, particularly in the arms and the legs, okay? Uh, curled toes, so just like curled fingers. And a high arc or flat foot is also one of the characteristics and even breathing difficulties. So these are all related to this Charcot Marie Tooth disease, type 2 and type 4. For your information, Charcot Marie and Tooth are the three scientists that discovered and put together the knowledge of this disease. And that's how uh, it arrived at this name. Okay, now here's the problem. Majority of people, when they have this kind of symptoms, it will be around 30 years old to even 40 years old. So imagine if you are the person who's affected by this disease, and coincidentally this disease will only come out, okay, in terms of the symptom, when you are at around 40 years old. So what happens by then? 40 years old, imagine if you were to get married, you, sh you would have got married already, and if you were to have children, you probably would have children at that age. So if you can imagine, let's say you are affected and your partner isn't, there is a 50% chance of passing on this child and married to disease type 2 and type 4 to your next generation. And the thing is, as with genetic diseases, it will not get fatter. Now, what do I mean by that? Okay, if let's say when you are affected by this disease, let's just say that you only have hand tremors and a little bit of muscular atrophy. But when your children get this disease from you due to inheritance, what's going to happen is that this child will have an earlier onset, meaning the symptom will show earlier compared to you, and he or she will be having more serious symptoms, okay? Right, so these, so just now we have talked about muscular atrophy, and now moving on to the next disease, it is called the congenital hypothyroidism. So congenital means that the person is born with this disease, that's called congenital. Okay. So, where is the thyroid? So the thyroid sits just right below, if you are a male, just right below your Adam's apple, he, over here approximately, and you can probably feel it, okay? But for people with congenital hypothyroidism, what happens is that they will have either partial or a complete loss of this organ from birth, all right? and. Uh, why is this happening? It is because the PAX8, TSHR, and the Duo X2 gene defect. Okay, and these are going according to the autosomal dominance pattern of inheritance. So, what do I mean by that? Okay, as you can recall, every human needs to have 23 pairs of chromosomes. Okay. If you're getting an autosomal recessive disease, what's going to happen is that you need two chromosomes to have this gene defect at the same time. Only then you will be affected. But as for this congenital hypothyroidism, if you get only one copy of the chromosome getting this kind of a mutation, it is already enough 
for you to have this disease. All right, so that's the major difference. Okay, so what happens is that if let's say the child getting this disease, they don't really move much. They are not very active at all. They don't cry much, they don't sit very well, they don't move much at all. And if they sleep much longer than other babies, or even if they grow into toddler age, they will still sleep much longer, all right? Uh, however, it depends on the severity. If let's say you, they have only lost just a bit of the, high, the, the thyroid organ, uh, what happens is that they might not even show any symptoms at all. If you don't treat this, okay, if let's say you're seeing the symptoms or if let's say uh, the doctors has done a, a lot of checking and they see that they have this problem, if they don't treat it, it will cause intellectual disability and even slow growth, all right? Okay, right, so the next disease, I hope I pronounced this correctly, the Pfeiffer syndrome, all right? So the Pfeiffer syndrome, what happened is that, okay, I'm not sure how many of you know, when the baby is born, actually their skull isn't fused yet, but when children they get this kind of a syndrome their skull will fuse at a very early age all right and this is caused by the fgfr1 and the fgfr2 gene mutation so what happened is that when the skull fuses early it actually prevents it from growing normally so in that case um, the children who gets the disease will have a bulging and a very wide eye, a very high forehead, and even an underdeveloped upper jaw and a beaked nose. So it is a very distinctive characteristic. And over half of the children affected by this disease will have hearing loss and sometimes tooth problems as well. So as you can see in this picture over here, actually this child is getting the lighter version of this disease. There are much worse cases. Okay, so now moving on to this trisomy 8 mosaicism syndrome. Now, it actually involves the whole chromosome. So just now, the diseases we talked about are affecting the genes within the chromosome. So it is a single nucleotide kind of genetic disease. But now we are talking about the entire chromosome, whereby, all right, around here, this is the eighth chromosome. Supposedly, you just need two copies. But now here's number three. But the interesting thing is, supposedly, the set of chromosomes should be the same in the entire, across the entire person. All right? You wouldn't have expected that some part of this person has three copies of chromosome A and the other part of the person, the, the same person I mean, has a normal set of genes. So this is called mosaicism, whereby part of the, that human has got this and part of the, that same person is normal. All right? Okay, so it depends on the severity sometimes that person might not even have the symptoms of this disease. But what actually caused trisomy 8 mosaicism syndrome? Now, this is something interesting because usually this disease is not inherited, particularly when you are the first generation who got this disease. So, what happened then? Okay, when human eggs and sperms they need to be manufactured in the body. Of course, in ladies, when they're still inside mummy's tummy, they had already have enough eggs for them to ovulate, you know, throughout the lifetime. But when they get when they bought when they were born, so before they ovulate, those follicles have to grow. And during the growth process, there might be some mutations that happen particularly if, let's say, they have bad lifestyles, if, let's say, they um, have drug abuse history, um, something like that, that, it actually increases the chance of getting something called a spontaneous DNA mutation, 
And for guys, it actually goes the same as well. If let's say for bad lifestyle and you know particularly with drug abuse, it might cause DNA damage. All right. So in that case, if you inherit defected DNA into the baby's genes, then most probably the child will be getting trisomy 8 mosaicism syndrome. Okay. But here's the thing. If let's say there's no apparent symptom in that particular child, okay, so he will go ahead, he or she will go ahead to get married and they will have children. And in turn, they will continue passing this particular problem into the next generation, right? So as you can see how um, this is the complication. As for the first generation, this is caused by the spontaneous mutation, but for next generation, it can be inherited all along. Right. So what is the characteristic in trisomy 8 mosaicism? It can vary a lot. It can vary from, you know, no apparent symptoms at all to quite severe symptoms. For example, it's quite a long list, okay? Longer than average head, okay? wide and deep eyes, sometimes thick lips, large foreheads, narrow shoulders, kidney problems, congenital heart problems, uh, lack of intellectual development, and extreme stature, either very short or very tall. So the symptom is actually, you know, quite a large portfolio. Right, so the last disease I want to talk about, and it actually will relate to premature aging. So ladies, do pay attention. Make sure even if you have this mutation, you don't pass this on to your children, particularly daughters. All right. So, okay. Um, so the Werner syndrome, also called a progeria. So this is a herita heritable condition whereby it actually promotes premature aging and also increases the risk of cancer particularly in the thyroid and also the skin cancer and also there's one kind of cancer that this is associated it's called the sarcoma so it is a kind of bone or soft tissue cancer all right so and the one more problem is that it also significantly increases the risk of something called the atherosclerosis, whereby there is a hardening of the arteries in the heart and it can also lead to a heart attack. All right, so it's a risk, it's not a must, but it is a high risk. Okay, so this sign of Werner syndrome actually will develop during early teenage or adulthood, sorry, childhood and also teenage as well. And sign includes uh, sometimes gray hair, the wrinkles of the skin, and you will be able to see this early in their 20s to 30s. So as you can see over here, this is a teenager, so um, this is a Japanese American. So when she was very young, okay, at around age of 15 years old, she looked normal. But can you guess when she reaches the age of 48, that's what she looks like, okay? So by the age of 48, she already looks like an 80-year-old uh, person. So this is Werner syndrome. All right, so you might be asking once again, what are the potential theropathic or management options if you get genetic diseases? So if you get a mutated gene and you want to correct it from there, you might need to have a gene transplantation or gene therapy. However, this is more like a fiction than a practical solution. So a lot of trans gene transplantation or gene therapy are still under development. They have not even been approved by the American Food and Drug Administration. So if you want to correct a mutated protein, remember, gene will create proteins. When you want to do a protein uh, correction, what you do is you do a protein replacement all right, or even a replacement therapy like that. Okay, so metabolic dysfunction you do sometimes call the um, uh, disease specific compensation. All right, or sometimes if you want to correct it from the orga organ level, you need the whole organ transplant. And so, as you can see, all of these you know are quite difficult solutions and 
they need a lot of time to do and the risk is still very high. So the best solution, the best cure is actually prevention. So what I would strongly suggest you is to do a genetic test right before you get pregnant. Right? So at Medua Healthcare, we have something called the pre-pregnancy DNA screening, which screens the couple for hidden diseases, hidden genetic diseases that you're carrying and that you don't know. So back in 2015, the Chicago University in the US has done a very shocking research where it says humans carry one to two lethal recessive mutations on average whereby humans carry on average one to two mutations that, if inherited from both parents, can cause severe genetic disorder or death before reaching reproductive age. And this so-called reproductive age is at around 15 years old. 18 years old, that is the legal age for majority of the countries in the world, but the biological reproductive age is at 15. So as you can see, a lot of these genetic diseases are very severe. And the University of Chicago worked along with Columbia University. So these are the, very, the, these are the top two universities in the US. Okay, so with our pre-pregnancy DNA screening, we have two parts to it. The first part is to screen for your chromosome, all right? So we will line up all 23 pairs of chromosome under the very powerful microscope. So what are we looking for? We are looking for large chunks of pieces missing or duplicated, inverted, or substituted. Okay, substituted means that, for example, chromosome 4 and chromosome 20, something from chromosome 4 has passed on to chromosome 20. Whereas a translocation is a two-way swap, whereby something from chromosome 20 goes to chro so, sorry, for chromosome 4 goes to chromosome 20, and something from chromosome 20 actually goes to chromosome number 4. So all of these, these five categories of genetic problems are what we look for at the chromosomal level. All right, so the next level would be to line up the genes in the chromosome and to specifically to check for 420 diseases or 420 genes in the chromosomes, all right? So as you can see, this is a rather complicated process. I wouldn't go into the details, but basically this picture actually tells you how difficult and how complicated it is for technology to extract the DNA from the chromosomes and to line them up so it gives you the accurate answer as to whether or not you are carrying the diseases that are related to the 420 genes. Okay, so this is a sample report whereby uh, I remember this is the female partner of the couple whereby she has beta thalassemia, smith lamy opus, and the Wilson's disease. So she's carrying all these diseases in her body, but the thing is that since she is only a carrier, she is not affected by these diseases. So what's the next step? We have to understand whether her husband is also getting these diseases. And fortunately, her husband is not carrying any one of them. So in this case, the solution is that she's free to choose whether or not she wants to go for IVF or whether she wants to go for natural pregnancy. So the option is open to her. However, let me give you another case. Just last week, we have another client who has got alpha thalassemia, all right? So it was the wife's the report, and when I open up the husband's report, guess what happened? The husband is also getting the alpha thalassemia gene. So in that case, what happened is that father is a carrier. The mother is also the carrier of the alpha thalassemia. So there is a one in four chance, meaning 25% chance, that their children would be getting the full-on alpha thalassemia disease and become affected, despite the parents are not showing this kind of a symptom. So 
Moving on next is the 50% chance of the child getting the alpha thalassemia gene and as a carrier without showing any symptom. And only another 25% chance that the child would be escaping completely from alpha thalassemia. All right, so 25, 50, 25, something like that. So in that case, we need to do some genetic counseling with this couple. And here's what I've done for them. So I've counseled them about this situation. I've explained to them why there is a chance of passing the disease on. So I explained this using probability. And the next thing is to prepare them to go for an IVF cycle. However, just the bare IVF is not enough. What we need to do is something called the pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. So in short, this is called PGD. So PGD is a technology whereby when the embryo is being created, it will go through a specialized machine to take out bits of the cells in the embryo to go for genetic screening to confirm whether or not this child is getting the alpha thalassemia. And of course, this applies to all the 420 genes that we are uh, screening, all right? So this is just one of the cases. And so hopefully what happened is that after our treatment, when we send them off to the IVF treatment, they will be having a healthy child. All right, so genetic counseling is utmost important because every couple needs a different solution. Now, for myself, I'm actually certified by the Royal College of Surgeons of England um, with the postgraduate certificate in surgery. So I'm certified as a surgical instructor. So this is my knowledge base. However, on top of that, I have been certified by the Stanford University with their Stanford Genetics and Genomics Certificate. And I'm certified as a geneticist in this way, whereby I'm able to you know, get my hands dirty in the works of genetics. And then next, because I have been certified as a geneticist, but, okay, genetics is quite a large field. You can be working within the plant industry, or you can actually help to edit the genes in the fruit to make it sweeter, something like that. But in terms of medical genetics, you need an, another level of certification. With that, I've been certified by Harvard Medical School with their genetic testing and sequencing technology certificate. Furthermore, the sequencing technology is actually generating a large bunch of genomic data. And in order to sort those data out and put them into a meaningful report, we need data scientists to do that. And for me, I am also certified as a genomic data scientist, or more specifically, next generation sequencing data scientist, also known as NGS data scientist. And I received this certification from Johns Hopkins. Right, so, okay, speaking of certifications, you might have heard of other commercial genetic tests that you know, their handlers or their sellers, they might not have proper genetic certification. So these are called the commercial DNA tests, all right, whereby you order a test kit from these companies, they send it to you, all you need to do is to swap your saliva, put it back into the test tube and send the whole kit back to the headquarters where they will be running the genetic test. And most probably, you will need to download a mobile app so that you are able to view your reports. It is actually quite an interesting fact to do, but the thing is that these commercial genetic tests, they can only be used for wellness. They can guide you how you should eat, they can guide you how you should exercise in order to look healthy and feel energized. And some of these genetic tests, as far as I know, they will even let you know which career direction you should develop. Okay, but in terms of the accuracy, I really can't comment on it. They can be very accurate. However, though, they cannot be used clinically. So clinical and not clinical, what's the difference? With us, with our pre-pregnancy DNA screening, it is a clinical genetic test, whereby the solution that backs up this DNA screening, all right, can actually be used 
in the clinical setting. For example, just now uh, I talked about an alpha thalassemia carrying couple whereby we send them off to IVF centers. And because we have this screening, we would have known about it. Uh, and because we are testing the blood, the accuracy of the test is actually at around 99.9%. Right, so the step two, regardless of the result, okay, we have to enhance the quality of the sperm and the egg. Why? Because even if you go for natural pregnancy, you wouldn't want a spontaneous mutation, all right? And even if you go for IVF, and particularly if you need PGS, PGD, meaning embryo genetic selection, you would need to prepare for it. So regardless of which direction it is, you still need to enhance the quality of the sperm and the eggs. So with that, we have traditional herbal supplements to back you up. And our products actually won the Reader's Choice Award 2021, awarded by Baby Talk Mama Papa magazine. So they are a very large media. And so the supplements that were awarded include VHC formula, female 1 and female 2, and they specifically pinpoint at increasing the function of ovulation, all right, and also the quality of the eggs. Secondly, we have the VHC formula male. It aims at increasing the quality of the sperm and also the quantity. Make sure they swim fast enough, <laughs> right. And also, our confinement products, confinement herbal supplements, have won this award as well. So after you have given birth, you need to recover from it. So our VHC formula confinement 1 and confinement 2 are packaged together to help your body recover uh, completely and also to recover speedily so that you are very well prepared for your next baby. Okay. And also with this business model, with this um, kind of practice, we have won the Super Brand Award in 2021. So this is a very positive surprise for us because Super Brands are usually won by very large companies. But through the 3,000 panel of judges, we have also fit the criteria. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of you, all of the audiences for giving us the support and the trust. Without your support and trust, we will never be able to achieve this. All right, so step three is the difference. Okay, so remember step two, we are enhancing your sperm and the eggs, but on step three, here is the moment of truth, whether you're going for natural pregnancy or IVF. Okay, let's talk about natural pregnancy first. So, at Verdua, we have something called the Home Artificial Insemination IUI, whereby in simplest terms, you do IUI at home, where nobody disturbs you, okay? So all you need to do is just three simple steps. Track your ovulation, confirm your ovulation, use the IUI toolkit that we have imported from the US, and help the sperms to reach there. All right, it is that simple. So the first step, all you need to do is track around two to three months of your menstrual cycle. Okay, how do you track it? Okay, use your basal body temperature. The basal body temperature is the temperature where you wake up in the morning. It's the most accurate. Uh, why? Because during ovulation, there will be a bump, just a very slight bump around a few degrees, uh, or even not a few degrees Fahrenheit, okay, when you are ovulating. Why? Because of the hormone called the luteinizing hormone, it is supposed to help the eggs mature, and that is why there is a surge in the body temperature. So track this around one to two months or even three months if you want a more accurate practice whereby, okay, you can spot this period of time. All right, this is so-called the ovulation window. So keep tracking it. And in the next month at around this time, what you do is you use this ovulation test kit that we've imported from the UK to test for positive ovulation. If during this window time, you test it, oh, okay, it is positive. And what you do is you use this toolkit that we've imported from the US, whereby 
minimal assembly is required. All you need to do is to assemble the syringe, assemble the hose, where you pick up the sperm from. So on the day where you decide to do this, what you do is ask your partner to produce a sperm sample and okay, put that into the fertility cup. Okay, let me show you step by step. Put that into the fertility cup and what you do is you assemble the hose when you assemble the hose, what you do is you use the syringe to pick up the sperm from the fertility cup, put the hose back, put the um, blue part of this kit, okay, where it will be uh, the main component, whereby the sperm will be transported into the cervix directly. It actually cuts 50% of the journey, and in, in turn, it also increases the chance of um, a successful pregnancy by more than 50%. Right, so this is particularly suitable if you feel very pressurized during the ovulation window time. So often a lot of our clients will tell me that, Adam, okay, uh, we know that, we are glad that the report says everything is okay, we don't have any mutation. But the thing is, when the ovulation window time comes, I feel extremely pressured. And when I feel that, uh, there's just no way we can get pregnant using the most natural way. You know what I mean. So, okay, this is particularly suitable if you are facing this phobia, but with males having low sperm count, poor motility, meaning the swimming capability is not good enough, or abnormal shaped sperms, okay, whereby, first of all, I strongly suggest you to use our VHC formula male to boost up these criteria first, and uh, for ladies with high amounts of antibodies or recurrent genital infections or even pain during the intercourse, it can be due to psychological factors, you can use our home artificial insemination IUI to run a shortcut. All right. So if the thing is that you have mutations in your gene and moreover, you have the same mutation in the husband and the wife, but what you need to do is to do embryogenetic selection. So what happens is that, okay, during the IVF cycle, you go and consult the doctor. If you decide to take up the treatment, you will get the injection. You need to stimulate the egg growth. After either 14 to 21 days, you go back to the hospital and the doctor will take your eggs, all right? So on the same day, what happens is that the husband needs to produce a sperm sample where both of these ingredients will be taken to the back of the lab where the embryologist will combine them together to make embryos, all right? So what happens is that this embryo will be sitting in the artificial womb called the incubator for around five to six days. That's the ideal, of course. So after five to six days, you have an option whether do you want to freeze these embryos immediately or whether you want to uh, actually do something called the fresh transfer. But of course, fresh transfer is not ideal because most probably your, the womb lining is not even ready for it. All right. So most probably uh, when you do the freezing, there will be another two options before that. Do you want to do PGSPGD or do you want to just go ahead and freeze it? Okay. So it's very difficult to answer this question when the doctor asks you without this, the result from our pre-pregnancy DNA test. So of course, if for any reason, without any genetic mutation, but you still want to do IVF, you really don't have to do embryogenetic selection. But if there's a mutation in, in the body, you need to do embryogenetic selection so that only healthy embryos will be put back into the womb. All right? Okay, so you might have a question, and why not we just all go for embryogenetic selection instead? That would be the most secure way. All right, two problems. Let's talk about the number one problem first. As you can see, this is the embryo and this is the needle. So. The scale of the needle and the, uh, and the embryo is actually quite, you know, out of place. So in that case, there is a chance of the embryo being damaged due to this process. So in summary, it means that 
Um, this process wouldn't increase the chance of a successful IVF cycle where it might actually decrease the chance of success. So that's number one problem. Number two problem is money because this PGSPGD process can easily increase your cost by 35 to 50,000 and that's on top of the existing IVF costs. One of our clients spent around 85,000 in just one IVF cycle. All right, and so you need not worry because under our panel we have the Alpha Fertility, Sunway Fertility, TMC, and Thompson Hospital that are working with us, so that I can personally follow up your case if I were to refer you there. And our genetics lab includes uh, advanced genomics and DNA laboratories. So these two top laboratories are working with us for your healthcare. And so is BP Lab and Path Lab. We can track how well you're doing in terms of the uh, fertility functions. We will do hormone and fertility blood tests through these two partners. Sonovision is an ultrasound expert and Gribbles is also similar to Path Lab and BP where they provide hormone and blood tests. Okay, so coming to the last slide, I just want you to remember this. Because your genes will determine your baby's lifetime health, and because genetic diseases are honestly literally not curable, okay, we can only prevent this from happening. So, I hope that you can give us a call right before you uh, decide to get pregnant so that I can guide you, okay, as to, all right, this pre-pregnancy DNA screening, after the result has been produced, I will be able to share with you best or you really have to do IVF embryogenetic selection. Thank you very much. I shall see you again next time to talk about chromosome 9. This video will be put on YouTube, so please do share it with your friends and family. Please like and subscribe to us so that we can update you with the latest fertility news. Thank you.